announcements and such things. Uh, as always, uh, there's this this homework that's due Tuesday, and uh, there were numerous technical issues with the homework. It uh, turns out all the flags on Canvas. We tried switching everything on and off, and it turns out the thing that fixed it was something that was not where it should have been. Um, so the TS figured it out. I have no. I still only vaguely understand what the solution is, which means the next time we have similar homework, we'll have a similar problem. Thankfully, the TS will fix it. Um, anyway, um, if this bothers you, tell me, please. Um, so uh, the, 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 the homework is due on Tuesday, and because of all these technical issues, we have decided to uh, increase one, give you one more attempt at it. So you get three attempts. Um, and the highest total between the three attempts will be the one that will take it. Okay, this is bothering me. No. And if you can't, if, if those of you at this end, if that seems too far off, feel free to uh, migrate. Well, I, all of that would make sense if the display off button works. Um, Okay, I'm going to turn the light on. So feel free to migrate to the other end uh, from here because uh, that's pretty much all we have today. So anyway, so we uh, the the homework three is multiple choice, uh, and you get partial credit, uh, meaning it, uh, if you if, I, I think all of them are no actually all of them are multiple choice. So there's nothing. Uh, 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 there may be some examples, some questions where more than one answer may be right. And if you get some subset of that right, you'll get appropriately uh, discounted uh, number of points. Uh, there's also a midterm exam in class next Thursday here. Um, and uh, it's going to be closed book and uh, closed notes. I posted some sample midterm. Uh, I, I, I Call it a sample midterm, but it's really like a set of difficult questions, possibly time-consuming questions. <laughs> uh, your midterm won't be that difficult, but uh, or that long, but, but it, it might have that style. So, uh, and between that and this homework, just think of your midterm as some combination of all of these things. Uh, there's a question on Zoom about uh, the in the sample midterm. There's a question that says calculate the information gain. And for that, you will need a calculator for the sample midterm. For the homework, I'm going to set things up so that you will not need a calculator. Uh, do you, you will not need any anything other than uh, you know, a writing instruments. So uh, I'll set the, if it turns out that there are complicated calculations to be made, I will give you the approximations that make thing work and uh, you can just use those. So it, the only things you will need are writing instruments and the ability to do fractions um, and machine learning. So uh, don't worry about bringing a calculator. In fact, I would encourage, I, I, I strongly discourage bringing, bringing calculators. Other questions about uh, the homework, about the midterm? Yes. When you say strongly discouraged, does that mean you can't bring a calculator? Don't, don't bring a calculator. Okay. Uh, you, the problem with calculators is, uh, Calculators are just mini computers, and uh, it it offers it can offer unfair advantage to those who bring it. Uh, in the form of, I'm sure there are calculators that can connect to the internet. Uh, not that that's necessarily going to help you because uh, I don't think it does, but it just it, it makes things complicated. So don't bring calculators. Yes. How about the trap table? What is the trap table? Like the uh, we, we I provide enough uh, okay. uh, empty sheets. It will be the midterms will be printed one side. Mm -hmm. So I think they'll be printed one side. I don't know. I'll, I'll make sure that you have enough scrap paper to uh, may do the stuff. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Oh. Uh, not both actually. Uh, let me, uh, so uh, given that I have not yet created the midterm, I, I can only go by last year's midterm. 
when I made the midterm last year, I was able to finish it in 15 minutes. Yes. My TAs were able to finish it in half the time that was allocated. Um, students told me that the time was not enough in the class. Um, the I, I believe that the midterm difficulty comes, is going to come from the difficulty of the uh, questions rather than the length. But since I have not yet made the midterm, I can't really commit one way or another. That's pretty much all I have. Uh, but you know, the midterms been I have been told the midterms hard. Like every single year, I've been told I make a hard midterm. So other questions. That was meant to be uh calming. I don't know how. I'm not entirely sure why, but that was supposed to be calming. Um Yes. The midterm is going to be a pre response question, right? Um, there'll be multiple choice, there'll be pre response, there'll be proofs. What they won't be is uh, coding questions. Is all the possible or I don't understand. What does it mean? I mean you just said that we have a multiple choice. Do you think all the possible uh, question only has one option? I, I don't understand. If there's only one option, that's the right answer. <laughs> You, you, you said that uh, we will have uh, like uh, the homework, the multiple. Oh, I see, I see. So the, is it a checkbox or a radio button? Uh, uh, it, it, it could be more than one answer, right? Yeah. Uh, like I said, I've not yet made the exam. So uh, I, I, you're giving me ideas. That's all I can say. Oh. <laughs> you're not the only one who does things at the last minute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay um uh, if there are no other questions we're going to continue from uh, uh continue our discussion of uh, back learning so just to kind of remind you of where we were in the last lecture we started looking at um this theorem called occam's razor uh kind of zooming up Zooming out a little bit, we're talking about computational learning theory, um, and we're talking about uh, specifically pack learning, probably approximately correct learning. And uh, he is the, the sort of building blocks of pack learning are the following. First, we start off with this assumption that uh, there is a fixed but un possibly unknown distribution that generates the data. And uh, training examples are IID samples from this. Future examples will also be IID samples of this. So the question now is, how much training data do I need to be able to guarantee low generalization error in the future? The, the only goal of learning is generalization error. So that's the first sort of uh, uh, building block. So this, uh, the, uh, the second thing here is, how do we define generalization error? The generalization error is defined as, uh, you draw a random example from this distribution. But you don't get to draw the example because uh, you uh, nature does it for you. In a randomly drawn example from this distribution, you ask the uh, the uh, the oracle system oracle model for the label f of x, and you ask your the, the classifier for its label h of x, and if they disagree, um, that's that's not good. That's an error. So the in a randomly drawn example, what is the probability of an error? That the generalization. Okay, so that's the the the, the sort of initial sort of uh, definitions that we have. Then comes the definition of pack learning. Pack learning says, uh, or pack learnability. Suppose you have a concept class C. We say that a concept class is pack learnable by some learning algorithm L, um, using a hypothesis space H. If for any function in the concept class, for uh, any distribution over the instant space doesn't matter. We don't get to control that. There are for uh, for uh, for two small numbers, epsilon and delta. Epsilon represents the error. Delta represents the uh, probability that learning fails. With high probability, with probability more than one minus epsilon, this learning algorithm will be able to produce a close enough approximation of uh, the true function. How? What do we mean? What do we mean by close enough approximation? 
one whose true error is less than epsilon. Mm -hmm. No matter what, and using m examples, provided m, the number of examples that this system needs, is a polynomial in uh, one over epsilon, one over delta, and the size of the hypothesis space, and also the dimensionality. This is a rather complicated definition. It has many moving parts. But the general gist of it is using only a polynomial number of examples, the learner can produce an approximation of any concept in the, um, in the concept space, a close approximation, and it can do so almost all the time with probability more than one minus delta. If this happens, then we say that the concept class is fat learner. Okay, we saw this definition, and then we moved into this discussion of Occam's razor. So we try to connect uh, um, we, the, 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 the path is slightly complicated. I define fact learning and then I prove a theorem. And then that theorem is going to help us test whether certain concept classes are fact learnable or not. But to prove this theorem, I had to make a few assumptions uh, because the, the math gets a little bit uh, hairy otherwise. The first assumption, just for now, is that the concept class that we are working with is finite. There are only a finite number of functions that we are going to work with. It could be exponentially large in the dimensionality, but there are only a finite number of functions. The second assumption that we made is that of consistency. So the consistent learner is one where uh, that produces a hypothesis that's consistent with the training set. So the question that this theorem is asking is, suppose I have a finite hypothesis space and I have a consistent learner, uh, that is consistent with m examples, and m is greater than some number. Can I say something about future examples that are not yet seen? And the theorem that we proved, and I'm not going to go over the details of it, essentially says this. For any hypothesis space, H, if you have more than m examples, where m is this expression, we'll come back to that expression later, that if you have more than those many examples, any hypothesis that's consistent with all M examples, we have not, we have noticed we are not talking about a learning algorithm. <laughs> we are assuming that the learning algorithm chooses that hypothesis. But any hypothesis that is chosen magically for all we care, to be consistent with M examples, these many examples, will have an error less than epsilon. And this is this, this statement that the probability of error is less than epsilon that statement is true with probability 1 minus delta. I think I made it more complicated than necessary. So let's uh, revisit this. With high probability, with probability more than 1 minus delta, the classifier that is that agrees with m examples that are drawn IID from some fixed and unknown but unknown distribution. With M examples, it will have a classified and agrees with M with the label on M examples, will have an error less than epsilon, provided the number of examples that this classifier is consistent with is more than one over epsilon times log sine of h plus log one over delta. This is we I'm not going to go over the proof of this because uh, we spent some time on that in the last lecture. This principle, this, this uh, theorem is one of a few theorems that are all called Occam's razor. In this case, this is an Occam's razor for the finite hypothesis class where we have a consistent learner. And it's called an Occam's razor because essentially what it says is this number, the number of examples that you need to satisfy this condition increases with the size of the hypothesis space. In fact, it increases logarithmically with the size of the hypothesis space. And the, it's Occam's razor because the size of the hypothesis space represents a measure of complexity. So searching over a small number of functions, if you accidentally find, uh, uh, a, a, sorry, if you find a function that is in agreement with M examples, if you search only over a small number of functions and you find it, chances are you stumbled upon something good. On the other hand, if you allow your search space to be anything, any function, a, a massive set, then you know, just by random chance, you might find a function that agrees with all the data because it's going to overfit on this. As a result, it will not do well in the future. This is the intuition. 
So this is where we stop at the end of last lecture. Are there questions? Thumbs up. One person says no questions. Going once, going twice. Two and a half. Question. Yes. Delta is so okay, good. Uh, there's a question on Zoom also. Um, I will come to the question on Zoom in a bit. So in, consider the case where the learner uh, is given a data set. Con consider the following event. The learner is given a data set and it produces a classifier. And that classifier has some error. The learner is given, the event in question is, does this classifier have a low error? So we are asking, what is the probability This probability is one minus delta. So changing the data set will change the uh, the classifier, right? And when this then this is an event. This event is uh, or this is a boolean uh, whether either the classifier has low error or not. And I'm defining low in terms of epsilon. If the classifier has low error, I would I declare learning to be successful. If the classifier has error more than epsilon, I declare learning to be a failure. And Delta is asking, what's the probability that learning fails? One minus Delta is what's the probability that learning succeeds? What's the probability that your learner produces a classifier that has a low error? Now, this is a slightly tricky concept because let me make it complicated just to kind of point out the entire uh, complexity here. What we are asking is, uh, let's first focus on this statement that classifier has low error. That is essentially asking probability of h of x not equal to f of x is less than epsilon. Right? And the statement about that is asking what is the probability that that holds? What's the probability that a certain probability is less than epsilon? And once you start writing it that way, it just seems painful. So I try not to mention that, but I declare learning to be successful if my learned classifier H has low error. One minus delta is the probability that learning fails. Does that uh, clarify things? There's a question on Zoom. In practice, we do not have the size of H. So what can we say about this? That's a good point. In practice, we don't have the size of H. And uh, that's really what we're gonna uh, talk about today. We'll look at specific classes of functions. And then we'll estimate the size of H for those classes of functions. And based on nothing but this theorem, we'll be able to say, is this class of functions learnable or not? And we don't even have to invent an algorithm. We just can, just looking at that, uh, this theorem, we can declare certain function classes to be impossible to learn. And that's the strength of this theorem. In fact, this, uh, this theorem automatically gives uh, a sketch of a certain type of a learning algorithm. And you don't necessarily have to do this, but I'll just illustrate. Imagine that you're given a training set with M examples. All your learning algorithm has to do is um, find some classifier that perfectly explains all M examples, meaning it gives the right label for all M of them. And then check the, that M is not too large. In particular, uh, check that M is some something of this size. If that happens, then for some the, the appropriate epsilon and delta, you can guarantee that your true error with high probability will be less than uh, epsilon. And the, the tricky part here is, how do you find some edge that's consistent with all examples? So you need to be able to do that efficiently. If you can't do that efficiently, then there's no point in uh, just saying that, yeah, there exists some function that is perfect. So there is also the computational complexity. So this is not a legitimate algorithm here. What I've described here is this conceptual algorithm where if you can find um, 
and a, a classifier that's consistent with the data. And if the data size, um, if the if the search space for your learning the classifier is not too large, then you you're good. That that's basically what this uh, theorem says. I'll, I'll illustrate this with some examples uh, uh, in a bit, but I want to kind of just, uh, before we go into examples, I want to uh, present some exa exercises that might be useful. So we've already seen the ID3 algorithm, right? Um, the complexity parameter, the, the key complexity parameter in this theorem is the size of the hypothesis space, the number of functions that exist. So the ID3 algorithm tries to find a decision tree. So the only thing that matters is how many decision trees exist if you have n features. Can someone answer that? How many functions exist if you of the of the type of decision trees uh, if you have n features? Is it two to the n? There's one answer that says two to two to the n. Are there other possibilities? Is to have so many possibilities that each features have. Boolean. Let's say we have Boolean features. Yeah, that's a good point. Let's say that we have Boolean features. In given, yeah, in fact, I say n binary features there. There's another option, two to the n plus one. Let me give you a hint. Um, can a decision tree, can, for any Boolean function, is there a decision tree that can represent it? Yes. How many Boolean functions are there? The number of Boolean functions is 2 power, 2 power n. So the number of decision trees is exactly that. Yes. Because every Boolean function corresponds to actually more than one decision tree. Uh, in fact, if you kind of look at the same, same Boolean function can be represented by multiple decision trees. So the number of structurally different decision trees is at least 2 power 2 power n, and it's definitely more than that because many trees represent the same function. What is log of 2 power 2 power n? It's still 2 power n. And in this expression here, let me zoom in. In this expression, the only thing that matters is log of the size of the hypothesis space. Log of 2 power n is exponential in n, which means in order to make any guarantees of decision trees, you need an exponential number of examples. This is the kind of statement that we can prove using this theorem. As a result, decision trees are not fact learnable. Because the set of all possible decision trees is too large. Con conceptually, here's how you, you should think about it. Remember when we were talking about decision trees, I said decision trees will overfit your data. Why? Because no matter what noise is in your data, your training error is going to be zero. So you can grow a tree that is large enough that will uh, that can over that can explain the data, no matter how complicated how much noise there is in your uh, data. That means that the set of all possible decision trees is so complex, it is so large, that uh, you, you need an exponential number of examples to guarantee that uh, future uh, examples will be fine. The problem is if you have Boolean, uh, if you have Boolean uh, features, there are only 2 power n examples possible if you have n features. So to get a fact guarantee, you need to see every possible example that exists. At which point, what's there left to learn? So there you can't have a fact guarantee with decision trees. Uh, another question is, are conjunctions fact learnable? And this is what we're going to talk about next. Are there questions about this? Yeah. 